Thank you for joining World to Come Ministries as we look at Bible studies, Bible readings, and worshiping God together as we look forward to the world to come. I'm grateful that the Lord's given us another opportunity to be together. And uh, are you roasting up in the balcony? You okay? How many's fainted so far? Three. Well, that's right. We got the air on down here, don't we, Pete? The air's on. We'll send you some in a minute. They get to shouting and running around. It'll circulate the air up there. <laughs> uh, we're just glad you're here. And uh, I want you to be praying. For the service tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, the Lord willing, I'll be bringing the message on the mystery of Michael Jackson. The mystery of Michael Jackson. Now, we've had good crowds all this week, but I'd like to fill the building up tomorrow night to capacity and carry out chairs. And, and I'd like for you to make a special effort to be here. You don't have to go to the fair every night. You can go to the revival meeting one night. And uh, let's just make a, a real effort tomorrow night to be here in the service. And I... We'll be praying, and I hope that you'll be praying, and we'll try by the help of the Lord to document some things for you, show you some things, and uh, we'll have some soundtracks that we'll play here in the service. We'll have some slides that we'll be showing. By the way, Pastor, we need to get a screen. My portable screen wasn't in the car after all, okay? And then uh, we'll be uh, having some record albums and some books that I'll be bringing to the service tomorrow night and we will document for you that the world is more ready for the Antichrist than the church is ready for the Christ. Now that's a pretty strong statement but I think after you leave here tomorrow night you'll agree with me. I'm convinced that the greatest evangelist that's ever been on this earth for the cause of Satan is rock music. And I will document that for you tomorrow night. That will not be an idle statement. You say, well, I wouldn't know a rock record if I met him in the road. Then you're the very person that needs to be here tomorrow night. Because you need to know how far the secular world has gone. It's, uh, it's uh, unbelievable how far we've gone towards uh, the actual acceptance of some things in our society. And we're feeling the effects of it. Many people don't understand the relationship between teenage suicides in rock music but uh, teenage suicides the number two killer of kids in America second only to accidents the number two killer is suicides but how many people realize that the new theme of what they call punk or new wave music uh, the theme of that is nihilism it's nihilistic that there's no tomorrow there's nothing to live for uh, the movie that's playing right down the road here Purple Rain starring Prince uh, is nothing but an hour and 30 minute rock concert and his hit song 1999 which we'll deal with tomorrow night I'll show you backward masking on the album and I will show you a sublineal lyricing on that album and then uh, he says on the back of his own album that uh, that there's no reason to live that Armageddon's coming that the party is going to be over there's no future so tonight I'm going to live like it's 1999 I'm going to satisfy my flesh. It's secular humanism. It's nihilism. There's no hope. Uh, Ozzy Osbourne and his music, uh, the invitation to the ultimate high, that is death, the death angel, the ultimate high. And uh, a lot of parents don't even understand where it's coming from. I think that you'll be surprised after the service tomorrow night, and I hope that you'll go out of your way to invite someone to be in the service with us tomorrow night. Now, we brought this message a couple of weeks ago over in Tennessee, and God saved 64 adults in one service that one night. So I hope that you'll be praying. Over 3,000 people have been saved in this message in the last 18 months. And if you'll pray, I believe God will meet with us. But we've just got to, we've got to ask God to help us. It takes the Lord coming to be with us. And if we don't do our homework, if we don't pray, then the devil will take it away from us. We wrestle against things that we cannot see. I've had my life threatened more this year over this one message probably than anything else I've preached. I had a queer waiting for me Friday night when I got out of the pulpit down in South Carolina telling me he didn't like what I was preaching. Uh, 
If you preach this day and age, there's going to be some people standing around telling you they don't like it. But uh, this isn't the time to cowtail and go to the house. This is the time to get you a new hope, as they say at the house, and hang on and preach till Jesus comes. And uh, we're just going to have to pray and ask God to stand with us. If he doesn't come, it's all over anyway. And uh, we, you say, well, Brother Ralph, you could have said he was a homosexual. Well, that might confuse your little child. But if I say queer, they understand exactly what I'm talking about. Say amen right there. If you don't, I'll think you're funny. <laughs> well, you need to understand some things, folks. We're living in a hellish age. The devil doesn't play fair, and he wants your children any way you can get them. He wants your family any way you can get them. And the only hope we've got is for God to shake us and awake us that we can be faithful in these last few hours till the Lord comes. And I want you to be here in that service tomorrow night. Final service here, unless God changes the menu. If he changes the menu, we'll leave that with him. Amen. I mean, I like to be obedient to him. Let's stand together, let you rest from your seats. And, uh, stretch a little bit, shake hands with somebody. If you gentlemen want to take your coats off and get comfortable, you feel free to do that. If you'd like to take your shoes off, just make sure your feet's clean. Amen. It's pretty close in here tonight. We just want you to be comfortable at the house of the Lord. We're God's people. There's no big Christians or little Christians, big churches or little churches. We're just a bunch of old sinners that's gotten saved by the grace of God. Amen. And if I'd gotten what I deserved, I'd already been consumed. I'd already be in hell. But I didn't get justice. I got justified. And I like that part. Amen. Let's pray together and ask the Lord's blessings upon the reading of the word. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be at your house. We thank you for what we've experienced here tonight already. We thank you for these our brothers and sisters that have ministered to us in song tonight and how they blessed our hearts. I pray, God, now that you'd take the remainder of the service and use it for thy glory. Help us to be obedient sons and daughters. Feed your sheep, and we'll be careful to leave here tonight giving you glory and honor and praise for what you've done and for what you shall do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Take your Bible and turn in the Old Testament to the 16th chapter of the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter number 16. While you're turning to the Old Testament, if I may encourage you to go by Brother Floyd's table after the service. The church has a wonderful bookstore here. And they've got books and records and tapes. Mountain Ministry has a radio table out there. But while Brother Floyd is here tonight with the group, I encourage you to stop by there and buy some good gospel music and put it in your home. It's one thing to take this away and to put this up, but you've got to have something to replace it with. And you'll be surprised what a wonderful place your home will be uh, if you'll just incorporate gospel music in your house and good gospel preaching on tapes. It'll, it'll change the atmosphere of your home. Many a morning, I'll drive in, get home 1, 2 o'clock in the morning when I'm within driving distance, get back to my family, and my wife will get up early. We have to get up every morning at 6, and... Uh, She'll start breakfast, and a lot of times she'll just, uh, instead of walking around telling everybody to wake up, she just puts on a gospel tape, and somebody singing, and it just does something to you. Wake up, somebody singing about Jesus, you know? It's hard to get the pooch mouth that way. It is. It's hard to feel sorry for yourself. When somebody's singing the, the glory of God when you wake up, it's hard to say, I don't feel like getting out of bed. You could have woke up dead, Fred. <laughs> say amen right there. Amen. That's right. A lot of people wake up dead, but see, uh, they wake up in eternity. And, but God let us have another day, and how are we going to spend it? How are we going to use that day, utilize that day? And we just need to thank you. And you stop by there, put some of that good music in your home. Throw Waylon and Willie out in the backyard, and Michael Jackson in the basement, and God will bless you. Amen. Amen. That'll solve a lot of problems over at the house. And uh, you just mind the Lord and all those things, and it'll help in Exodus chapter number 16, I want you to think about this passage of Scripture as the children of Israel have been delivered from bondage. Back in the 12th chapter of Exodus, we had the Passover, the blood sacrifice. And uh, we read the other night about the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. I brought the message here on the Red Sea singing. We have all these singing conventions, but they're behind time. The first one was held at the 
banks of the Red Sea, the Red Sea sin. We talked about how the children of Israel uh, crossed over. They crossed from death to life. And a beautiful typology in their crossing. They had been redeemed by the blood, but they had to leave slavery and go to victory. And that's what the Red Sea produced in their life, and that's what we want to do. But as we continue in the messages of this week, I felt a real burden for God's people. I don't know if I've ever seen a day and an hour uh, that I've seen God's people going through any more than they're going through today. I've never seen churches under such a burden. I've never seen preachers under such a burden. I cannot tell you just some of the phone calls I've had in the motel this week from uh, across the country, the battles that our people are going through, wading through, and it's unbelievable, and it all just lets me know that Jesus is coming, and he could come at any moment. You, if you went by the flesh, you'd like to throw up your hands and say, I can't stand another phone call, and I can't stand another sad story, and God knows I can't stand to see any more of your children hurt, but God knows about it before I knew about it, and he said, I won't put on his sheep, on, the, on his little sheep any more than they can bear, any more than they can stand. And it just lets me know that redemption draweth nigh. He says in his word, he says, when you see these things, bite your fingernails, take four vams, drink 16 cups of coffee, smoke two packs of cigarette, and try to make it through the day. That's not what he said. He said, when you see these things, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. He said, when, I, when the heat's turned up, when the pressure's on, when the devil turns up the burner on, that, on the grill and he seems like he's cooking the life out of you and the life out of your home, the life out of your marriage and your church, when it seems like the devil's pouring out all that he can against you, God said, you remember that I'm aware of what's going on. And when it gets rough, you just remember we're getting ready to go to the house. Redemption draweth nigh. He knows what we're waiting through. And I was with a preacher just a, a few hours ago and uh, it, it breaks my heart to realize what some people are going through. Uh, but Brother Floyd, this precious man of God, had uh, run into some controversy in his church, and he wouldn't back up on preaching against sin. And he left town to go visit his wife's family. And when he came back, he found out that they'd cut the power off to the parsonage and told him he was through. Didn't even have lights to, to load his furniture and his belongings. And, and uh, one of the men that was working as the treasurer was supposed to have been paying this car payment. And, and they'd gotten mad about it, and he didn't know it, and they hadn't paid his car payment. And uh, they came to her with a wrecker and towed his car off out of the driveway while some of the men of the church stood in the churchyard and laughed at him. And uh, they had to go move in with some of her relatives, and the wife was so stressed by all of that had happened. She got sicker than she was, and he finally had to put her in a hospital. And... Uh, uh, she de had developed double pneumonia and stayed in the hospital 18 days. And he said, Brother Ralph, God's my witness. Said there wasn't one preacher in town came to see me or my wife knowing we had lost the church and knowing the trouble. He said, uh, he said there wasn't a church uh, came to visit us. Said there wasn't a preacher came. Said we didn't have any Christian friends that we thought we had in that former church come to see us. But he said, Brother Ralph, he said, I used to be wicked in this town. And he said, some of those boys that I used to drink with up at the corner bar, he said, those drunks set up on the bar stools on Friday night and made up $150 and carried it up to the hospital on Saturday. Now, boy, what a testimony that is. What a slap in the face that is. But there is where we're living if we're not careful. We're so busy playing church and playing religion that we're forgetting to live Christianity. It's not what you say over here at the building that counts. It's what you're living out there among lost people that makes the difference. And friends, we desperately need to learn to love one another again. We desperately need that back in our churches. We desperately need it back in our congregations. Whatever happened to taking up for God's people and for the things of God. And what, where did this whole spirit come from that we love it when another church has trouble or when they split or, or when they go through a hard place? What an ungodly spirit that is. What an unchristian-like spirit that is. And yet it seems that because of all the adversities that are taking place in the land, that that spirit's on our churches, and it seems that God's people now feel even more isolated than ever before. They feel more cut off than ever before. And, and one of the things that we're wrestling with is this thing uh, in our Christian lives, this feeling 
that we are isolated in a dark, dark age. Now, there's no denying that we're living in the last moments of the last days. We cannot deny the fact tonight as believers that these are the few minutes of earth's time before Jesus comes back. There's no argument tonight that we have lived to see the perilous times. There's no argument tonight that men's hearts are failing them for fear. There's no argument tonight that if you look at circumstances, you'd never go to church again because you'd say, what's the use? We've already lost the battle. It's true. It's never been a day like this. We've never had more, more religious talk and more religious programming and exercises, and yet we've had, never had a day when we've got less influence on our communities than we have today. Our churches have been made nothing more than religious social clubs. Now, with that kind of world and that kind of situation, it's easy for you, a believer, to get locked in the combat and to feel that you're all alone. If it's awful easy to sit on a church pew and the devil to sit down beside you on the church pew and say, you're wasting your time. No one really wants revival. No one wants to really serve God. No one wants to really be spiritual. And the devil comes in so many arguments in so many different ways. And the whole time, what he's trying to do to you, the believer, he's trying to isolate you in a dark night. He's trying to isolate you spiritually. He's trying to isolate you emotionally. And he's trying to take you from a place of feeling that you've got brothers and sisters in Christ to thinking that you're all alone. And then if he cannot work on that way successfully, he'll try to make you think that God's forgotten you. And if he can't do that successfully, he'll try to confuse you or to bind you up or cause you to doubt that you'll even say, I don't even know if I'm saved. It's so dark in here. But I've got good news for you tonight. The God that we serve knows all about darkness. The God that we serve says that he dwells in the thick darkness. The God that we serve tonight, he knows how to take care of you when you're in those islands of doubt, when you're walking through those tunnels of confusion, when you're spending the midnight hour all alone and fearful, we've got a God that knows how to take care of us in those times in our own lives. And the children of Israel, they set the same type of example here. When you begin to read in Exodus chapter 16, the, I don't have time to read all of the verses, but they've journeyed into the wilderness. God's already given them ten miracles. He's already blessed them by delivering them. He's given them the miracle of the Red Sea. He's watching over them. He's caring for them. He's providing for them. And yet when we get down to verse number 2 of chapter 16, it says, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. You say, Brother Ralph, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't murmur against Moses and Aaron. If I'd have been there, if I'd have been able to see all those miracles, I surely wouldn't have murmured. Yeah, I know. I've prayed those same kind of prayers too by my bed, just like you've prayed by your bed. Lord, I'm going to pray more. I'm going to go more. I'm going to read more. I'm going to give more, be more. I've done the same thing too. We're flesh, friends. And the more we say we're going to do many times, it's that old flesh that's hindering us time and time again. And it's just the grace of God that any of us are here tonight for this service. It, you know, if we'd have gone by the flesh, not one would probably have been here tonight. It's the goodness and the grace of God that brings us here. And this 16th chapter of Exodus teaches me something. Human nature hasn't changed. It's still the same. Men are still men. Verse number 3. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Now you think of it. They had been delivered from slavery and suffering, and yet they had the audacity to look Moses and Aaron in the face and say, why did you guys bring us here? I'd rather be down in Egypt and somebody beating on me with a whip and making bricks. said, because at least when I got through making bricks, I had all I wanted to eat. said, we may have been slaves and we may have been servants, but at least we ate well. I wish I was back down there in the flesh pots. And how many times when the testing gets on, how many times when the trials come to our house, 
how many times when the devil comes and attacks against your home and your family and your marriage, do you look out the window at a neighbor or look across the road at a relative that's not serving God and they seem to be prospering? Those in your own family that seems the more they're wicked and the more they're ungodly, it seems like the newer cars they drive and the better health they have and it seems like the, they get the best kind of jobs and, and the devil stops by your house and he says, don't you wish you were back in the flesh pots? Don't you wish you were back down there in Egypt's land? Isn't that the way he comes to us? Isn't that the way he comes and attacks the children of God? He tries to get you to watch men instead of watching Jesus. He does it time and time again. And notice what verse number 4, I don't have time to develop all these points that I would like to, but let me just show you what he said. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. God told him, he said, Moses, you quit worrying. I'm going to feed my people. And if I have to, I'll rain bread from heaven. And the assurance that God gave Moses is the assurance that God can give to me and can give to you tonight. When I think of all the different ways that, that I am tried and that you're tried and all the ways that you're tested and that I am tested, it's wonder that any of us know our own names tonight. But at the same time, I have to remember that when I feel like I'm sitting in the darkness and starving to death, do you know what is frustrating? You know what's frustrating is to go to a camp meeting or to a jubilee or to a good Sunday service or to a revival meeting and all around you people be going, Amen! Praise God! Hallelujah! Be weeping and crying and wiping tears and laughing and you're sitting there going, I don't feel nothing. What's wrong with me? And this guy beside you, you look over there and smile and he says, Hallelujah! And you say, well, I didn't feel nothing. You look over here and this blessed saint's crying over here two rows in front of you, fellows laughing. See, that's the wonderful part about rejoicing in the Lord. On the same pew, you may have a fellow laughing. On that end, on this end, somebody be crying, and they're doing the same thing, worshiping. That's right. And, and you look around, and you say, what's wrong with me? What did I do bad? I, I'm hungry too. <laughs> I, I'll take a biscuit, you know. I don't have to have a whole loaf. He's obviously got a whole loaf. But I'll take a slice. <laughs> I, I mean, and you wonder, what's wrong with me? But what God wants you to see and me to see, that sometimes in that darkness is a place where God wants you to go, that you'll look for Him and not look for a man. Amen. A man can't bless me. Now, I can be blessed by the actions of men. I, many a time I've sat on the platform and so weary and so exhausted emotionally and physically, you thought, Lord, how in the world can I preach tonight? And then look out over a congregation and see smiles on the faces of God's people and see them rejoicing and see them crying and, and, and shouting the victory and get blessed watching God bless them. And it strengthens you. And God will do that to you. But at, what I was saying was that a man cannot come to me and bless me. He cannot put a blessing package on me he can't come over there and put a prosperity package on me. He cannot assure me by his words or his actions that I will experience the blessing of God. There's only one blessing, and there's only one blesser, and he is the God of this universe, Amen. and it's when he comes around that I get blessed. And you know why I get blessed? Because that great big God tries to get in little bitty me and there's just not enough room, hallelujah, and things get full and running over. You begin to enjoy the presence of a holy God that'll come and feed his sheep. Now, the devil will try to make you feel isolated. He'll try to get you to go on feelings and emotions and I'm not saved on feelings and I'm not kept on emotions and, and we are, there's not a verse of scripture for that. I'm saved by faith. I am kept by the word of God. And whether I feel saved or not, that's not what matters. What matters is God said, if you'll ask me, I'll do it. And he can't lie. Amen. And the devil will try to come to you and he'll say, well, so-and-so got in this way and so-and-so got in that way. And I read a book where so-and-so got it this way and you didn't get it any of those ways, so you must not have it. Right? Reminds me of a professor I had in college. I was a history major and a psychology minor, and, 
and he was talking and illustrating about uh, the human nature of people that we want to have an associational type thing. We was talking about moods and transitions and he was talking about this rooster and these chickens in this chicken pen one day and he said that the farmer's wife went out to feed the rooster and the chickens and said she forgot to attach the gate and the gate came open and all the chickens got out and they went all over the barnyard and she was trying to get them back in and said so she just went over to the corn crib and took an ear of corn and shucked it off and she made her a little trail right back inside that pen and put a pile of corn in there said she went and sat up on the porch and said all those chickens got to feeding around and pecking and they started pecking on that trail and they just picked their way right in and got inside the pen. She just got up out of the rocking chair and went over and closed the gate. And that old rooster looked at her, flapped on the fence and said, I ain't falling for that. And so he, she got to chasing that rooster and chased him down through the barn, around by the pig pen, up back by the cows. She finally hemmed him in somewhere down there in the apple orchard and caught him and him a squawking and a yelling. And she carried him upside down, him a flapping, and she opened the chicken lot and threw him in there. And first thing he did was run up there and got on the chicken house and flapped his wings and said, the rest of y'all aren't in here because y'all didn't get in like I got in. <laughs> huh? Now, isn't that what we do over at the church? Isn't that what we, we try to measure our experiences on someone else's experience? when you've got a unique God that comes and talks to you personally like he doesn't talk to me. And the devil comes and tries to rob you of that relationship. But that's why I want you to know tonight that God can fix you supper in your darkness. He can come to your house. He can come to your place. He can come to your work. He can come to your school, to your university, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. You might be driving a long haul truck like Brother Wayne does, or you may be working up here hanging on a power pole. You may be working over at Burlington. It doesn't really matter. Maybe up at Westinghouse with Brother Pete. It just doesn't really matter where you are. But I want you to know wherever you are, God can come to you and minister to you and feed you. You don't have to starve to death out there in that wicked world. Amen. He's not going to lose you. He knows all things. And He knows about you. Now, if I had time tonight, I'd give you... A, a lot of points here, but let me just hit the high places. If you're making notes, you can study these in your own devotion time and they'll help you. But let me just show you uh, five or six things quickly. First of all, the manna that God promised here, he said, I'll rain bread from heaven. The manna was sent to Israel in a barren desert. Exodus 16, 3, it says, into this wilderness. They were in a wilderness and they were hungry. In Jeremiah 2, 6, it talks about the wilderness, the desert, the drought, and eventually death. When you're in a wilderness, there's not even water to start a garden. There's no soil suitable to raising food. When you get in a wilderness desert, there's nothing to do out there but die. And that's where God sent the manna. He sent it to a barren land, to a desert land. But what... In 1984, has God done to us? Has He not sent Jesus to a spiritually barren world? Do we not have Christ and He is the bread of life? And what has God done with Jesus? Aren't we in a spiritual wilderness tonight? Aren't we in a land that's dead and dying without the knowledge of this same Jesus? And God has sent Jesus just like He sent the manna. God has sent Jesus you read in Isaiah 55 and 2, the question is asked. He says, why do they spend for things that don't really matter? They spend for bread, and bread can't save them. Talking about the physical things. Only God can save a man's eternal soul. And then in 1 John 2, 16, all that is in the world is not of, this, is not of the Father. All that's in this old world is not of our Father. And the, this world out there cannot help you. It can't, it can't help you with your problems. This world can give you temporary pleasure. This world can give you a temporary sensation. But this world can't put peace in your heart when you go home tonight and put your head on your pillow. There'll be folks tonight that they'll spend all a week's wages over at the Halifax County Fair. And they'll get on a ride tonight and they'll go around and around and around and around and around and around. And they'll get off and say, boy, wasn't that fun? 
said, give me some more tickets. Here's some more. Ha ha, back on that. All right, here we go. And they go, boy, wasn't that fun. And every now and then, I like to get on there and that crazy too. But what I'm talking about is they're looking for happiness. They're looking for joy. And it's not on a, on a carnival ride. Well, hey, think of it. We'll go to the theme parks. We'll go to King's Dominion. We'll go down to Six Flags. We'll go to the theme parks. And we'll stand in line for an hour and 30 minutes to get on a ride that lasts 90 seconds. Huh? Now, the only smart person I've ever found at those parks is that guy taking up that $12 at the gate. Huh? And we'll stand in the hot sun and step on each other's toe and hold screaming youngins and drip ice cream and get cotton candy in your ear. And boy, we're here. This is it. <laughs> oh, boy. And we get on there. Zip, zap, zip. That's it. Get off. <laughs> when does it start? I, oh, that's all there was to it. I stood in line an hour and a half for this. But that's what happens. And that's temporary. And yet the world's starving for something. They're making multi-million dollar parks every year and they're building more because we're trying to get happy. We're trying to find something to hold us together because the world's crazy and lost its mind. And so we're trying to find a reason to face tomorrow and the reason is we drove right by him. His name's Jesus. And you know what? If you want to spend a day being crazy, that's your business. I do it occasionally. Uh, well, I do it more than occasionally. I'm crazy about it every day. But uh, uh, if you want to go and ride a ride, you know it's a lot more fun to stand in line that hour and a half and be able to meditate on the Lord and to think, boy, I'm glad this isn't the only happiness I have in my life. Hey, it, what a difference Jesus makes. What if that was the only little thrill you could get out of life? What if that was the only sensation of, of happiness? That's why there'll be people, they'll drink all weekend. They'll drink all weekend. They'll drink constantly. They'll drink beer, they'll drink wine, they'll drink hard liquors, they'll drink all weekend, trying to get through, because they're lonely and they're miserable and they don't want to go on living and they'll try to finally go into a fretful sleep and doze off and hope they'll wake up Monday so they can go back to work and get their mind off their problems. There's people that'll they'll, they'll do drugs all weekend. They'll smoke marijuana and, and snort cocaine. They'll try to find some happiness. They'll ride up and down the streets trying to find a reason to go on. When you and I have got the greatest reason in three worlds, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what the devil does is he tries to get us feeling sorry for ourselves and all we can see is the darkness and we never see who's in the darkness with us. Jesus Christ. God didn't say it would be easy. He just said, wherever I ask you to go, I'll go with you. And what a difference that makes. Secondly, the manna came to Israel as a gift from God. Exodus 16, 4. He said, I, the Lord, will rain bread from heaven for you. And then in Exodus 16, 15, this is the bread which the Lord hath given. And then Christ, if God sent the manna to Israel as a gift, what can you say about Jesus coming to this barren land? For God so loved the world that he gave. You see, it was a gift from God. God didn't get lonely one day and have to save man. God was perfect and had no need. God said, I'll redeem fallen men that he might bring glory to my name. And he sent the gift of his own darling son. And my friend, he's a gift. And then if we read in John 6 and 33, he talks about Jesus being the living bread. I don't have time to go through all the scriptures about Jesus being the bread of life, but I know one thing. If we begin to feed on the true bread and get out of the junk food of this world, it'll change things at your house and it'll change things at the church and we'll see an effect on our communities. But as long as you're over eating potato chips with the devil, you won't ever grow spiritually. 
But if you'll go over to God's house and get out of the junk food and get you some good biscuits and gravy off of God's table, then business will pick up. Amen? Amen? Because you'll begin to grow. And now, notice thirdly, the manna was unrecognized by Israel even though God said, I'm going to send it. Exodus 16, 12 and verses 15 and 16, God told them, I'm going to send you the bread. I'm going to feed you. And then when the bread got there, they didn't know what it was. They didn't recognize it. They had no name for it. And God had to name it. Look in, uh, look at verse number, verse number 15 of Exodus 16. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. They didn't know what it was. The descriptive passage in the preceding verse talks about manna and describes manna, and they didn't know what it was. They didn't recognize it. They didn't understand it. And there it was on the ground, and they didn't know what it was. And God said, even though I'm going to send it, I promise you, when it got there, they didn't recognize it. And the same thing's true with the Lord Jesus Christ. God promised to send His Son, and when His Son got here, they didn't recognize Him. They said, you can't be the Messiah. They took Him out and nailed Him to a tree. The same is true. Christ was unrecognized by the world, even though foretold by God. Now... Fourthly, the manna had to be gathered and eaten by Israel. In Exodus 16, in verse 16, it says, Gather every man according to his eating. And then, when I began to think about that, I realized that some of them went out to gather the manna, and they saw everybody gathering it up, and they said, Well, you know, I don't want to do this every morning. This is sort of silly. I'll just gather enough today to do me for a week. And they went up and gathered out extra, you know, and then the next morning everybody got up and started gathering, and they sat on the front porch of their tent and said, I'm smarter than these guys. I got enough in the kitchen to do me all week. And then when all the manna was gathered, everybody went in to eat. And they said, let's go in and eat. And they went in and found theirs had been infected, turned to worms, and it had rotted and it stank. It had to be gathered and eaten. It couldn't be saved except one day a week when God extended the shelf life of the manna to last them through the Sabbath. You can't go over to the house of God and eat once a week and get through the week. Huh? It bothers me if you eat just once a week and think that's enough. It bothers me for folks to think they can eat every other Sunday and be just fine. Something's wrong. We need to gather him daily into ourselves. There needs to be that daily fellowship there. And Christ must be gathered and must be eaten. Christ has to be received and trusted by us. And they had to have trust and confidence in God when He provided the manna. And we've got to have trust in Christ as God sent Him to be our provision for this wicked world. Fifthly, the manna was Israel's daily food until the journey ended. Exodus 16, 4 talks about gathering a certain rate every day. Exodus 16, 21, and they gathered it every morning. Exodus 16, 35, Israel did eat manna 40 years. Manna was their food until the journey ended. How long is Christ going to be your food? Till the journey ends. As long as God asks me to be on this earth, Christ is going to be my sustenance. He's going to be my food. He's going to supply all of my needs until the journey ends. And then sixthly, the manna was placed in the very presence of God. God told them to gather up an effort of the manna and put it inside the ark as a memorial, a testimony to how God delivered his children. And of course, a lot of Bible scholars believe that that ark of the covenant is in the presence of God today. And of course, Jesus was sent to this earth and he was the redeemer of men. And today is a testimony to that. Where is Jesus Christ? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's already in the presence of God as a testimony that he bought you and he bought me. Now that'll give you the main points to study. Manna was sin of God. Manna was a gift of God. Where the manna was sent to, why the manna was sent, how the manna was gathered, the working of it, and yet all of it is a type of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But now here's the part I want you to understand. 
that manna. Let me read you the description of it. In Exodus chapter number 16 and verse number 14. Exodus 16 and 14. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. A small round thing. White. Down verse 31, we read about its color. talks about it being white. Now God told the children of Israel, I'm going to feed you. It's going to rain bread. All right? They're murmuring. They're complaining. Let's go down there. Millions of folks living there, camped in their tents. They've come through the victory of the Red Sea, and they're hungry. And they're complaining to Moses and Aaron and saying, Boy, you got us out here to starve to death. And God dealt with Moses, and Moses prayed, and he said, Now, son, you go tell them I'm going to feed them. If I have to rain bread from heaven, I'm going to feed them. So Moses got up at supper time. He stood around the tents, and he said, Now, children, he said, God said he's going to rain bread from heaven. He said, You're going to eat. So you go to bed said, God's going to feed us. He's going to rain the bread. Now, up and down, all of those tents, you know what was going on that night? Down here in this tent, this guy was went to sleep. He said, boy, in the morning, we're going to have hot bread, yeast rolls. I mean, there's going to be bread in the morning. He's in his tent, you know, and all he can see is big old yellow yeast rolls and big slab of cow butter on the top of it. And boy, he just dreaming of hot yeast rolls. In this next tent, there's a hillbilly Jew there, and he's dreaming of cornbread. He said, boy, in the morning, bread's coming. All I can see is that big cake of cornbread. Bless God, hallelujah. We're going to have cornbread in the morning. And then over here was a city slicker, and he was dreaming of Danish in the morning. The bread's coming. Boy, and all he could see was those Danish. I mean, he could just see that hot Danish in the morning, and he's dreaming of it. And over here was a country boy in this tent. All of them, now, he said bread. But bread's different things to different people. You get the picture? Down here in this tent, he's dreaming. Boy, in the morning, cathead biscuits. Hallelujah. Said, we're going to have cathead biscuits in the morning, big as wagon wheels. Said, we're going to have a time. Hot bread, it's coming in the morning. On down here, this other fella, he's dreaming of bread, and he's got it pictured as hard rolls with sesame seeds on the top. And he said, how oh, in the morning, we're going to have hard rolls and sesame seeds on top said it's going to be one. Bread's coming in the morning. They all went running out of their tents the next morning. Ah! What is this? It snowed. The ground's white. That's what the book says. Looked like a frost. Read your Bible. The ground was covered white. Where's the bread? Moses, there's no bread here. Some little small round something all over the ground. It got darker than it had ever been because they had heard a word from God and God said, I'll deliver. But when they got out of their tents the next morning, he didn't deliver like I thought he'd deliver. Huh? You get the picture? You begin to understand? God doesn't always deliver us the way we think we're going to be delivered either. God said, now Moses, that's the bread I rained from heaven. I didn't send Kroger bread, and I didn't send A.M.P. bread. I sent heavenly bread. And that way no man can lay claim to it. No man's got the recipe for this bread. It's heavenly bread, and the name of it's manna. Now, if you read on down in that same chapter, it said it had... Uh, it tasted like a honey-filled wafer. Huh? It had all the right proteins, amino acids, enzymes for perfect health, and yet it tasted like dessert. How would you like to get to eat banana pudding every day and it not make you fat and make you feel good? Huh? I'd like that. Amen? And that's what happened. God said, not only am I going to feed you, but it's going to be dessert every meal, and yet it won't be fattening. It'll be the right kind of proteins, and it'll make you strong. You're going to feel good. 
God said it'll taste like a honey filled wafer. God provided the bread. Now, notice how the Word of God described it. A small, round thing. You know what that smallness speaks of? The insignificance of Christ. The world doesn't think much of Jesus tonight, do they? They sure don't live like it. The world doesn't think much of our Jesus. And they didn't think much of Jesus when he was there in Jerusalem. If it hadn't been for a bunch of rowdy Pharisees, they would have ignored him. But because a bunch of religious Jews got mad, they got outside the walls of Jerusalem and crucified him. And that smallness speaks of the insignificance to the world. The world doesn't think much of us sitting over here tonight when we could be at the fair or we could be at the home in the recliner with our feet on the auto. They say, well, you're sort of crazy letting some guy yell at you when you could be at the house eating a bloody sandwich and drinking a burpsy cola. They say, what's wrong with you, man? You're crazy. Huh? They don't understand that. It's small and insignificant, but they don't know what's going on in our hearts tonight. Do you see? Now, that's the smallness of it, but then he said it was a round thing. Now, if God would have wanted to, he could have rained down hot loaves of bread with the butter in them. He's God. I don't think he can't. If he wanted to, but it just shows what they knew. <laughs> I mean, listen, if God had wanted to, he could have sent rolls still hot, still warm from the heavenly heaven. He's God. If he can throw a star out in, off of his fingertip and put it in a socket for all eternity, don't you think he can't make a little roll? Huh? If he can go over the garden and shovel up some old red clay and breathe life into it and call it a man, don't you think he can't make a loaf of bread? Huh? He's God. But we look at the circumstance time and time again instead of looking at the Savior that's over the circumstance. And God wants us to understand, I'm going to deliver you children, but I'll deliver it the way that it'll bring glory and honor to my name. And he said, this bread is not going to be like a loaf you're used to seeing. It's not going to be oval like a roll. He said, it's going to be round and small. Well, that's a dumb way to make bread. But that's the way God wanted to make bread that day. Well, why did he make it round? He could have made it square. He could have made it triangles. He could have made it inverted parallelms for all he wanted to do. He's God. But he made it round. You know why? Because the roundness was preaching a message. If you draw a circle, a circle has no beginning and no ending. It's a continuous line. There's no straight edge, a point to turn, and then a point. It's like a wedding ring. It means the same significance of a wedding band, unending love. And he said, I am going to build some bread, and when it gets to earth, it'll preach about my son. And he sent that talking of the eternalness of Christ without beginning and without ending. It was small and it was round. And also there was no rough edges on Jesus. No rough edges on Jesus. When they were over there at the high priest's house, Caiaphas' house there in Jerusalem, and they were beating on Jesus and smacking him and abusing him and cursing him, he didn't revile them. He didn't say, you guys just wait till I get back to heaven. I'll French fry all of you guys. Huh? He didn't do that. He didn't say, you wait. He said, I could call 10,000 angels and kill every one of you. This He didn't do that. I would have done that. You would have done that. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus just sat there as a lamb before the shearer. He had no rough edges. And that bread way back there in the Old Testament was testifying to the glory of this Jesus. And then there's something else you need to notice here that I believe will help you. It says, And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing. Now, when does the dew fall? When's the dew fall? At the night, doesn't it? It's falling right now, isn't it? 
If we have dew tonight, it's falling right now. When that sun goes down and the ground begins to cool, that's when the dew falls. Now, did you know that the dew is a type of the Holy Spirit of God? The dew is a type of the moving and the working of the Holy Ghost of God. It's, a, it's an example, a type of the Spirit of God. And do you know that dew came in the early evening, but the manna didn't come then. The Bible says that it's when the dew had already fallen, verse 14, the dew had already fallen before the manna could come. And then came the manna. Well, you, listen, that means that the manna came between the midnight hour and the rising of the sun. The manna got there at the darkest part of the night. I mean, when it looked like there was no sunrise, when it looked like there was no tomorrow, when it was absolutely the darkest part of the night, that's when God sent the bread. The dew came in the early evening. The dew came in the early part of the night. But after the dew had fallen, then comes the bread. And now you begin to see the comparison to your life and to my life. Because one day, my life was a barren desert. My heart had been hardened by sin, baked in the world, baked with skepticism, rebellious and turning against God. But what happened to me is the same thing that happened to you. One day, God in grace and mercy, He sent to do the Holy Ghost to soften my hard heart and to make it something moldable and pliable, something that can be used by God. And God sent the dew and it applied it to my life. And there, when the dew had come and had completed its office work, then and only then could Jesus come. The Holy Ghost introduced me to Jesus. The dew brought me to the bread. Hallelujah. In the darkest of the darkest night, it's the Holy Ghost of God that senses your midnight and knows what you need. For He's the Comforter. He's the one that abides. He knows when you can't take another day. He knows when you can't take another tomorrow like you had today. He knows when you can't take another hurt, another pain, another adversity, another misunderstanding. And that's when the do, the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to bring the bread. I'm bringing the one to meet your needs. He won't put on you more than you're able to bear. There's when the table is set for you in the darkness. And you know what else that testifies to? The wilderness was the dirt. And every morning when the dew came, every night when the dew came, the manna came, not one time, not one time did God put the bread on the dirty earth. He always put the bread on the dew. <laughs> and the dew covered the earth. You get the picture? God said, I'll put the treasures of grace in earthen vessels. And through the office work of the Holy Ghost, God can take fallen, wretched men like you and like me and make us something fit for the Father's service. He said, after the application of the Holy Ghost, the bread Jesus himself can come and abide in us. You think about this, friend. 4,000 years before Christ was born. 4,000 years before Christ was born. Salvation always came from a stable. Abel Offered a what? A lamb. Abel had a lamb from a stable. Isaac was on his way to die. There was a ram from a stable provided salvation. Abraham offered the heifer salvation from a stable. Every goat and every sheep that was slaughtered in the inner holy of holies. And the blood was applied for the children of Israel. Every one of those animals came from a stable. But 2,000 years ago, God sent 
salvation and it came in a stable again because he sent Jesus down to a stable in Bethlehem. And the typology was continued all through the Word of God. Jesus came out of a stable. Salvation to this day comes out of a stable. The Lamb of God, that's where he was born. But there's something else you need to see. When was Jesus born? Why shepherds were what? Watching their flock by what? By night. <laughs> That's when my Jesus came. He came at night. Little Mary, tired in body, traveling up to Jerusalem to be taxed. No room at the inn. Joseph, lovingly watching over her, knew that she could deliver at any time. Talk the innkeeper and let him go there in that cave, in that stable. During the night, the Holy Ghost of God moved and said, This is the appointed time, Galatians 4 4. The fullness of time has been reached. Mary brought forth the living Son of God. They wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. He came at night. For men that were living at night, he came in the darkest part of the day. That's when Jesus came. That's when the manna came. The manna came at night in the darkness. God set the table in the darkness. And tonight, God sits the table in this old dark earth that we're living in. He's prepared a table for every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl who wants to have life eternal. Christ came at night, just as the manna came at night. We need to understand that Jesus Christ his righteousness is symbolic of the whiteness of this manna. We begin to, if you read on down in this same chapter, down at verse 31, it says, And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like a coriander seed, white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. This same Jesus is compared to the coriander seed. And that coriander seed, you can still buy those seeds today. They're used for seasoning. And they're snow white seeds. And they said, that's Jesus. He's righteous and pure and white. You know what they do with coriander seeds besides seasoning? They grind them up and make them into a tonic. The tonic is for the healing of the stomach. And that's where the bread goes. And he'll heal what's wrong with you tonight. This Jesus knows every hurt. He knows every burden. He knows every hard place. He knows every rough place. And he said, it may seem like darkness to you tonight. It may seem like a fog bank that there's no end to. It may seem like you're on an island all by yourself and isolated. But he said, you just remember that that's when I worked. I came in the night. I fed the children of Israel in the night. And I'll take care of you in your darkness. I'll prepare a table for you. When it looks so dark, you don't know where to go and what to say and what to do. I'll feed you. I'll take care of you. I'm Jesus, the bread of life. When you begin to think about his relationship, doesn't the word of God say, come and taste of him, see that he's good? When you taste of that manna, it's wafers made with honey. It's good. He's good tonight. He's good to me and he's good to you. But how many times I neglect to love him and to thank him a table in the darkness. Each one of us tonight could testify. I dare say that before five or six people had been to that mic to testify what you're wading through, what you're battling, what's going on in your life, I dare say everybody in this building would be weeping and crying to know there's that much hurt in this building tonight. Wouldn't have to go very far. Wouldn't have to go through many people. It would all be weeping in this service tonight to think about all the hurt here tonight. But you've got to remember, regardless of the pain, regardless of the hurt, regardless of the misunderstanding, regardless of the isolation that you may feel like you're cut off and don't have a friend on this earth that knows or understands, you remember right in the middle of that darkness is this same Jesus. He said, honey, you're too weak to even chew. He 
said, I'll just break off a piece of meat. But you can't chew. Sometimes you get too weak for a whole slice. You ever had the flu real bad? You ever been real sick? You don't start back to the road to hell with a T-bone steak and salad. You start out with maybe a little soup, maybe a little corner of a piece of bread or some crackers, and you'll nibble on them. I don't know if this will stay down or not. I've been so sick. Just a little, and that's what the Holy Ghost does. He comes over there, he's the dude. He just breaks off a little bit of the bread of life. He says, you're going to make it. I'll not leave you. I won't put on you more than you're able to bear. When I'm too weak to cut my own bread. When I'm too weak to chew. Well, there is that sweet fellowship of the Holy Ghost of God. Come and feed this little child. Like I said Tuesday night, you remember this. You only go into a dark place halfway. The rest of the time, you're coming out. You only go in a tunnel half the way. The rest of the time, you're coming out. You may not can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but you're only in there half the way. The rest of the time, you're on the way out. You only go into your problem, into your sickness, into your burden, into whatever's heavy on your heart tonight. It's only half the way. The rest of the time, God's bringing you out. He said, while you're coming out, I won't leave you alone in there. I'll feed you. I am the bread. I'm the manna. Eat of me. Know me. And I'll give you the strength that you need. Let's stand and bow here. Lord, just pick a song out, whatever the Lord's laid on your heart. Children, I wish tonight that I had the vocabulary and the words to come to you personally and to tell you what your Jesus has done for you. I wish I had the strength to take your hurts, your heartaches, your misunderstandings, some of you are standing here tonight with children that have broken your heart. You never dreamed they could hurt you that way. You've got grandchildren that you're grieving to death over. Husbands and wives that aren't saved, breaking your hearts. Some of you are going through spiritual battles. Some of you have gotten a report from the doctor about your health. You'll never be well again till Jesus comes. All of these things are part of the journey. What I want you to see tonight is, I may not can change the circumstance, but I can point you to the Savior that's in the circumstance with you. His name's Jesus. He'll fix supper for you in the darkness. Are you hungry for your first love? Are you hungry to get your tears back? Are you hungry to get that tenderness back to the things of the Lord? Are you hungry to have revival in your life? Don't stay out there in the wilderness hungry. Come to Jesus. We're just going to open this altar tonight for an old-fashioned altar prayer. Whatever your need, whatever your burden, I want you to just step out of your seat. Come and pray as they sing. That's right, just mind the Lord. This service was for you, ma'am. This was for you, sir. Come on. Keep minding the Lord. That's right. Keep coming. Use these front benches for alders. Just keep coming.
what's got you pressed out of measure, come to Jesus. Come to the bread. He'll feed you in your darkness. Get the strength to go on. Come on to Jesus while He's calling. Where's your heart? Jesus can fix it tonight. Oh, tonight, children. That's right. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being at your house tonight. We thank you that you're a prayer answering, Father. Lord, we thank you for the dew, the Holy Ghost of God that melted our hard hearts one day and brought us to the bread of life, the man of heaven. God, we pray tonight for each one that's come to this altar, each one that's prayed. I pray tonight, Father, that you'd meet every need. Lord, you said if we confess our sins, you are able and just to forgive all unrighteousness. And God, for those that have been going through a hard place, those that are hungry tonight for the dew to fall again on them afresh, to soften our hearts and to give us our tears back, to restore our first love, and let us be about the Father's business. How many times the devil comes and tries to discourage us from being faithful, to discourage us from going on, God, let us see that in the midst of our darkness, in the midst of our doubts, praise <laughs> God, you'll set a table for your little children. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. We love you tonight. Help me to trust you. And help me to obey you. And I'll praise you for all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching. Please like and share this video. And join us next time as we worship God together. In the meantime, keep looking forward to the world to come.